Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Hawthorne, Deputy Director for Research at the Project on Middle East Democracy, or POMED, in Washington, DC. And I'm pleased to be here today with Dr. Mona El Kobashi to talk about her new book, Bread and Freedom, Egypt's Revolutionary Situation, published earlier this year by Stanford University Press. Welcome, Mona. Thank you, Amy. By way of background, uh, Mona is an assistant clinical professor at New York University. She earned her PhD at Columbia University. She's very well known among the community of uh, Egypt scholars and Egypt analysts as being one of the most astute and informed observers of the Egyptian political scene. So it's a pleasure to have you, Mona, to talk about your new and long awaited book. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. So Mona, I loved this book. It's beautifully written. It's chock full of insights on every single page. And it gets closest to anything I've read. And I've read a lot about this period in Egypt, the 2011 through 2014 period. I think this book gets closer to cap than anything else I've read to capturing the experience of that time in Egypt. And I think it's really a model of how to understand such a complex period. So congratulations. Thank you so much. That's um, the best compliment that I could get from a reader, especially somebody who followed the events so closely. And I, um, I think on purpose wanted to uh, discuss the events because so much of what I've read sort of skirts over or summer, somersaults over the events. So I'm so pleased that you um, highlighted that. Yeah, I really, I really, really enjoyed reading this book and I can't uh, recommend it highly enough. Um, to experts and followers of Egypt, but also to people who are interested in revolutions and revolutionary situations in general beyond Egypt. So let's jump into some questions that I have for you. The first question is, there's been a huge amount written on the January 25th uprising in Egypt and the pivotal 2011 to 2014 period that followed, but your book really stands out. Can you talk a little bit about how your approach and your argument differ from other literature on, on this period in Egypt? So let me start with the point that you noted and um, the, uh, the thing I mentioned about events. When we encounter so many events and such a dense agglomeration of events in such a short period, we're talking basically about 30 months or 36 months, three years, there's a tendency among analysts to try to either pick some of the pivotal events or to just jump over the events entirely and to say, well, that's way too much detail. There's a lot of noise and let's just try to extract the main trends. And I, I actually think those are very stimulating kinds of studies to step back from the events and try to make sense of them. But I also think there's another approach and that's the one that I tried to resurrect and um, uh, accentuate in this book. I try to, instead of evading the events, uh, I try to construct an analytical narrative of events, both the ones that we remember, but also the ones that have been completely brushed out of the narrative yeah. partly because they're so dense, but also because they're so small. So most people assume that they weren't that significant. They only look at big events, just as they look at big actors and assume that only if you get a handle on those big events or big actors, you'll understand what happened. But the fact is that when you have moments of upheaval, by definition, you have so many small, new, uh, seemingly irrelevant or marginal events that go into the making of the outcome and then we forget them later. One of the things I try to do is to bring those in systematically, not to do a uh, tedious blow by blow as most people would think. Uh, this is not by any means, if anybody tries to do a blow by blow of Egypt's three years from 2011 to 2014, it would take at least a thousand pages to try to get those. My book is- At least, much, if not uh, 2000 pages. <laughs> and and uh, the book is already um, a little bit on the long side at 392 pages total. So um, what I try to do instead is to provide this, what I call this analytical narrative. And I use this concept that you mentioned, which is right on the cover of the book, Egypt's revolutionary situation. 
situation. This is a concept. I did not coin this. Uh, the person who actually coined it was in 1915, Vladimir Lenin, uh, <laughs> coined this concept to describe what happened in Russia after the 1905 revolution. But, and by it, he meant a, a moment of extraordinary opportunities for revolutionaries. Um, I just give that kind of background just to give credit where credit is due. But I really was inspired by two American sociologists who took the concept of a revolutionary situation and made it analytically operable for us as analysts. And that is my uh, beloved advisor, Charles Tilley, and his colleague, Arthur Stinchcomb. And both of them looked or rehabilitated this concept and said what it is, is a moment when there's a shift in power over a state that represents both extraordinary threats and extraordinary opportunities for every member of the polity, including existing elites. So it's open-ended about what happens. It doesn't say that when you have a shift in power over the state, you're going to immediately get democracy, or you're gonna get revolution, or you're gonna get, it leaves it open-ended and it fronts the struggle, which for me is the most fascinating and confusing and complex aspect of Egypt 2011 to 2013. And what I found is that most analysts are uh, either evading that struggle or don't think it's important because they're more interested in the outcome. And what the outcome was, the victory of the military. So they take that outcome and they reason backward. And they say, oh, the military had it planned out from day one, from the minute that protesters filled Tahrir Square on January 25th, 2011, the military already knew that it was going to strike and reconfigure Egyptian politics to put itself at the center. Um, I'm not caricaturing uh, what people are saying. These are actual, there are books that argue this um, that have been published. So I'm trying to go against that grain by reconstructing that level of confusion and uncertainty. And I think the book will succeed or fail depending on how well it does that. It can't just be a tedious uh, calendrical, like on this day, this happened, the next day that happened. There's no way that you can um, articulate or come up with anything of value by doing it that way. Instead, I just keep a very close account of who comes into the fray. Are they old actors or are they new actors? And then how does their interaction lead to outcomes that no one anticipated? And then those outcomes lead to further interaction and further interaction until we have to stop somewhere. So I stop uh, the book itself with 2019 and the constitutional amendments that the military regime uh, passed through in April 2019. I think what a sentence at the beginning of your uh, chapter one of your book really captures, I think, what you're getting at and sort of sets the tone for much of the book. And you write, this is the very first sentence, quote, the 2011 uprising was the biggest accident in Egyptian political history, anticipated neither by its champions nor its adversaries. Um, the themes of uncertainty, uh, surprise, confusion are, are permeate your entire narrative. Can you say a little bit more about that and why you made the decision to center uncertainty, confusion, surprise in your analysis? Uh, which is one of the things that makes this account, in my view, very different than, than other accounts of this period in Egypt. So um, thanks for uh, flagging that. As I state, I'm by no means the first or the last person to center uncertainty. Every study that I have read about this period, books, monographs, policy papers, almost every single one of those studies mentions uncertainty in passing and then moves on. And I had a moment as I was re uh, researching, I was like, but uncertainty is the name of the game. It's not something that's incidental. It was actually the thing that was driving everything, including as you uh, graciously read the first sentence, the very uh, beginning of this thing. If we all take our minds back and maybe listeners may remember 20, uh, 10 years ago, if you remember on January 25th, 2011, we all were both anticipating something that would happen, but we had no clue what would actually happen. Most people thought there would be a very, very big protest because of what happened in Tunisia, but most people also thought that it would be part and parcel of Egypt's tradition of political protests. Lots of people would go out on the streets the police would either accommodate or repress them or alternately do both, and then everybody would go home. Uh, so we just have to remember constantly that uh, we have a tendency in retrospect to think that whatever happened had to happen. That's, that's just a very common hindsight bias in all social analysis. 
And I just wanted to go against the grain of that hindsight bias, because I think when we actually look at the uncertainty that I make such a big deal about and that I center in my analysis, whereas everyone mentions it as if it's um, you know something to be expected, but now let's look at the real hardcore. I think the real hardcore was the uh, uncertainty. What do I mean by uncertainty? I mean that A, there were so many actors interacting at any specific point. What was so confusing is that a lot of the actors were familiar to us from Egyptian politics. So the military, the Muslim brothers, the secular uh, activists, et cetera. But we have to also remember that many of them were new. Uh, these were people who were, uh, or groups that were formed out of the result of the experience of the uprising. And many of them were also fleeting. That means they were ephemeral. Many of them came in, they were central for a few weeks, and then they disappeared. But they left in their wake. The reason they were important is that they made the big actors act in particular ways that we tend to forget and make it seem as if it was a pre-planned interaction among only three big actors. So I try over and over again. And as I tried to do that, I surfaced events that I had forgotten, even though we were following this hour by hour. I had completely forgotten the linkages among certain events. Let me give you a small example that may seem strange. And I remember at the first, at the beginning when I saw this, I, I sort of dismissed it because it made no sense to me. This was the um, biggest disaster in Egypt's soccer history or football history. The um, murder and the uh, killing of 72 Ahli fans on February 1st, 2011 at a tournament in Port Said between the Ahli soccer team and the local Masri team. Why does this matter? Why are we talking about a soccer tragedy, tragic as it is, in a revolutionary situation? Well, because that violence um, and the unprecedented scale of the violence was immediately attributed to police collusion. Um, and this made it to the idea almost everyone in Egypt believed that this was a reprisal by the police for the ultras, uh, the Ahli ultras participation in the uprising throughout 2011. It quickly made it into on the floor of the newly constituted parliament. Parliamentarians of all political stripes stood up and accused the ruling military of colluding with the police to punish the ultras. And it became a signal event in Egypt's politics from 2011, uh, 2012, all the way to the middle of Mohamed Morsi's presidency, because the trial of the football fans who committed the uh, atrocities, uh, there were sackings of, it created so much political controversy and demands for responsibility and accountability that hit at the heart of why this uprising began in the first place, which was police brutality and police uh, abuses. So that's just one among many examples of how I learned as I was looking back through the events about how events that we either forget or marginalize or call a, a soccer disaster had a direct and very consequential impact on the actors and how they acted. I think you really masterfully show how certain events that, as you said at the time, we were all watching hour by hour, sometimes minute by minute on certain days, they felt really important at the time, but then in just the incredible chaos isn't the right word, but just fast moving, the fast moving nature of what was taking place, those events like like uh, like the, the soccer uh, football match tragedy you mentioned kind of recede, at least they receded into my mind, the Ali El Silmi declaration about how the, cons how the constitution should be written. I think you properly highlight this as something that was very pivotal Believe it or not, I had actually forgotten about that, even though I you know, studied and followed this period so closely. So the book is so valuable for reminding us and explaining critical events, but without really getting bogged down in sort of um, just a chronological narrative. So hats off to you for doing that. Not, not easy. I can only imagine that I was sort of imagining you working on this book with like a huge table spread full of papers and notes and like reconstructing um, chronologies and narratives and putting the pieces together, but you really managed to pull out, I think, what really were pivotal, pivotal events, even if they didn't seem so at the time. So along this, uh, you know, theme of uncertainty, confusion, unknown, uh, one another thing I really appreciated about this book is you do a good job of highlighting or mentioning or reminding us things that happened that we still don't fully understand why they happened, who was responsible. 
I think it's an incredibly uh, careful book, as we would expect from you, Mona, such a careful scholar, at uh, attributing uh, causality, responsibility, documentation when that's available, but also noting when something is remains to this day unclear, unknown. So I wondered if you could pull out for us maybe one or two events, things that happened during the Egyptian uprising in the years after that for you remains confusing, unknown, uncertain? What is something that maybe 20, 30 years from now, you're hoping you can get your hands on that one document or interview that one person and kind of find out the real story of what was behind it? You know, um, you're really attuned to how the process of writing this was. And for anybody who uh, cares about Egypt and cares about where it is now and where it was, uh, these are the questions that I think all of us daily have to think about. One of the, uh, to uh, directly just take off from what you just said, one of the things that I think we tend to think that we know, but if we're honest, we have to acknowledge that we don't know. Let's take the most powerful player, the uh, constituted Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, which is uh, a group of about 18 to 22 uh, generals and heads of the Egyptian army. This was an ad hoc grouping. This is not a grouping that existed before 2011. It only met during Egypt's wars with Israel. The last time that it had convened was in 1973 during the war. So this is not, uh, we tend to think that the Egyptian military is this rock that exists as a monolith, as the guarantor of the regime. That is true, but we also have to remember that the Egyptian military was and uh, continues to be shrouded in secrecy by design. One of the things that I think are the great unknowns is the decision-making process of this group of generals for this entire three-year period. What I mean is, how did they, we know that they constituted themselves formally on February 10th, the same day that Mubarak gave his ill-fated third and last speech. They constituted themselves, and it was very clear to all observers that they were going to make a move. Um, now, from that moment forward, from February 10th, all the way to mid-February 2014, when they convened to give their blessings to Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to contest the presidency, we can only observe what's publicly available to us. And one of the things I tried to do was like a detective piece together how the military's public pronouncements, and they had many, many public pronouncements, and their policy reversals and advances. I tried to piece that together from the public record. But I'm not naive, and I know that there were also a very valuable private record of how they responded to particular events, how they strategized uh, around uh, particular moments. And I don't think we'll ever know that, at least in our lifetime, as the Egyptian uh, military continues to be not just even more powerful now than it was in 2011, but also bolstered by uh, the US uh, Pentagon and all European ministries of defense, because it's uh, an excellent customer for them for their high-tech weaponry. Um, so one of the great unknowns is, how did this group of generals, and a rotating group, by the way, it wasn't uh, always set, it's by definition and by design, they rotate every six months. How did they perceive these events? What were the internal dynamics of their decision making? What were their collegial and ideological differences and their personal differences? And I'll just note a quick example for those who may remember this and follow the ins and outs of the Egyptian military. When uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi ran for uh, his scripted presidency a second time in 2018, we got our first inklings of differences among the generals. When the former number two of the military, the senior ranking Sami Anen, made a bid to run against Sisi, and it was the first time that we publicly saw a falling out among the generals, and as a result, Sisi had him arrested and imprisoned until very, very recently to prevent him from uh, contesting the elections along with him. So the evidence is there. Um, they have also indicated that they keep very uh, uh, precise records, uh, and we might expect that as for any bureaucrats, especially military bureaucrats, uh, Egypt has a long tradition of state bureaucrats uh, recording everything. The problem is that we don't have access to those. So that's the big unknown. The other big unknown is a pivotal event that I uh, focus on in chapter four, and that is the Muslim Brothers' decision to contest the presidency in 2012 what by most accounts, even at the time, was their most ill-fated and probably most catastrophic decision. Right. The reason I say that is not that I think it was necessarily a mistake. It was that it was a moment of peak conflict between the Muslim brothers, the generals, 
and the Muslim Brothers civilian allies, both in parliament and outside of parliament. And you recreate that period, by the way, so well, the sort of multidimensional nature of the political conflict that was happening and the gamesmanship that all sides were playing without knowing really where the other was heading. You know, I had to uh, devote a whole chapter to just six months. And this is not a decision I made uh, from the get-go. I had no idea that I would have to do that. But then ultimately, when I started looking back at the chronologies, as you pointed out, I have pages and pages of chronologies. It was impossible to cover this multidimensional struggle. Uh, and by the way, it, was only not, it wasn't just only those three. There were massive protests happening on the street uh, supporting each of these different players. There were international, it was the uh, biggest crisis in US-Egypt relations at that moment because the United States had publicly pressured and humiliated members of the SCAF for the SCAF's um, roundup of 43 right. American NGO workers. That too, we forget uh, that right. this was the Egyptian revolution witnessed the biggest crisis in US-Egypt relations since 1979 and the biggest crisis in Egypt-Saudi relations since the 1970s when an Egyptian worker was abused by uh, Saudi police and it created a big kerfuffle. And right, I had also forgotten about that important Storming incident. <laughs> because it all happened within the first six months of 2012. I mean, those months, I, you know, I wrote a whole chapter on them. They bear a whole book, just like 2011 bears a whole book. And one of the things I truly hope is that other scholars will take up this challenge and give us more accounts, not less, because the more we move on in time, the more amnesia will take, uh, take hold. And also because uh, the ephemera that I built so much of this on is going to literally evaporate, and then we won't have access to that history anymore. That's right. I, I think it remains, I guess, for a future generation of scholars who may potentially have access, for example, to um, the military's record, as you referred to, to put together or to explain another dimension of what was going on. But I think one of the many things that's so valuable about your account is that even when there are things that we don't know, and you, as I said, you acknowledge that, that you don't know them, they're not known. What was the military thinking? What was Mohammed Morsi thinking? Or what was the Muslim Brotherhood thinking when they decided to um, you know, field, I guess, originally Khaira Tashatur, but a presidential candidate? But I think one of, as I said, one of the things that your book captures so well is that even when the motivations and strategies are unknown, the events that occurred in the public sphere, even without knowing why they happened or what, what the motivation was, they themselves, even with uncertainty and confusion, set in motion a whole other chain of events. So in many ways, the fact that we don't know what was really behind some of these decisions and moves, it's not that it doesn't matter, but we can still understand um, the political conflict, the struggle, as you say, uh, as it actually unfolded, even without knowing that backstory. So I think the backstory of some of these events will be a very good complement to your book, mm -hmm. but it certainly won't supersede it. Uh, Mona, I wanted to ask you also, you write something very interesting on page 243. You write, quote, I have no quarrel with the judgment that the 2011 uprising is a failure, although defeat would be the more precise term. Why is this distinction important? Thanks. Um, I have a big problem with failure as a historiographical trope. First of all, let's point out that uh, to say that something failed, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I'm not at all contesting. Um, other, I would be a very naive and out of touch person if I thought that uh, what happened after uh, the coup and its aftermath was not a failure or wasn't catastrophic. However, uh, the thing that I find problematic about the term failure is it sort of leaves it at that. It's a very uncurious term. It is, as the historian of Europe, Christopher Clark points out, he himself, he's writing a book on 1848, and he said that he initially was repelled from studying this period because it was constantly called a failure. So it's a disinvitation and a disincentive to inquiry. And I think there's a reason for that. I think that uh, interests, very powerful interests, want us to think of what happened in Egypt as a failure that should not be studied. So that's one sort of political polemical aspect I have with it. The, uh, the defeat distinction, I got that from the wonderful Sudanese protesters uh, in April 2019, one of the biggest slogans that they had outside the military headquarters in their sit-in was a big banner that they held up that they wrote, victory or Egypt. 
that is victory or defeat. And the reason why I think defeat is a much more accurate, precise, and thoughtful um, label for what happened is it brings out that interaction. When you say that something failed, you, you're almost saying, well, we don't need to look into it. It failed, so forget about it. But when you say something was defeated, immediately the question is, well, how come? Who was it defeated by? Uh, what was the source of the defeat? What was the substance of the defeat? And it just, to me, it's much more of an invitation to investigation as opposed to shutting down any uh, rational, calm reconstruction. Um, and I'm not, I, I don't think there's such a thing as being neutral, especially if one is Egyptian or cares about Egypt, there's no such thing as neutrality. So this is not what this is about. What it is about is let's reinvestigate this and see what, happened, uh, present it as accurately and as precisely as possible. And then what comes out might be actually really interesting. So if you'll allow me just a quick uh, example for that. When I looked at this, I was one of those people on July 3rd, 2013, and I said this on national television, this was a coup. Um, there was a huge resistance to calling this a coup, very similar to what happened in Tunisia this July. And there were political fault lines. If you uh, were against the Morsi government, you did not call it a coup. And if you were against the military, you called it a coup. And so, you know, there's no, I, it's not like I'm sitting on some Olympian tower and judging everybody else. I also had a, a stakes and opinion on this as an Egyptian citizen. Um, however, when I actually looked back at the events, um, Amy, I reappreciated why so many political leaders, activists, ordinary citizens were deeply fearful of the Muslim brothers and uh, highly suspicious to the point that they would ally with the military against an elected, if imperfect, uh, highly error prone president. Uh, I reappreciated that because I understood for the first time that the Egyptian political field is a very asymmetric field. And unlike Tunisia, it has this big political organization called the Muslim Brothers who have 30 years of experience in elections and all of the other political forces don't have that experience. Yeah. So from their perspective, it, they saw the future of Egyptian politics under a democracy as basically a form of political obliteration for them, that they would never ever be able to match up to the Muslim Brothers electoral power. So in a way, just looking at the events calmly, I understood, not that I condoned, but I understood why they would want to act quickly to eject the Muslim brothers from Egyptian politics because otherwise they felt that they would be eradicated by the, the, the sheer dominance of the Muslim brothers. So that's what I mean. I just hope it leads to greater understanding even among people who think they know what happened. Yeah. Like me. <laughs> um, I uh, just learned so much about Egypt but also about just political interaction at a moment of extraordinary danger and extraordinary opportunity. One of the things that struck me about your choice of the word defeat, and I don't know if this is what you intended, but it's what I took away from it, is that when I read the word defeat and then I'm immersed in the, the struggle, the political struggle that your book describes, strangely, it leaves me with a feeling of optimism rather than pessimism about what can happen in the future. Failure to me suggests, you know, overdone, no possibility of this struggle re-emerging in a new form in the future and maybe having a different outcome. Defeat, for me, really captured a struggle, a multi-sided struggle, but with one you know, very powerful actor, the Egyptian military, and that one side or many sides in that were vanquished, but they could potentially rise again and, and, and enter into a new struggle and a new cycle. So oddly, because I say oddly because this period in Egyptian history is, is, is very tragic in some ways. And with all the people we both know who, who suffered, you know, as a result of, of, of putting their lives on the line for what they believed in, it's not a very optimistic period, but somehow <laughs> the reading this book did leave something open in my mind that the struggle is not over, you know, it will, it will continue and there will be another cycle of conflict and most likely another revolutionary situation in Egypt will occur again, maybe in our lifetimes, Mona. Thank you, you so much. Better than I did. Uh, that's the best conclusion I can think of. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. I want to really recommend 
to all students of Egypt, Mona's book, Bread and Freedom, Egypt's Revolutionary Situation. As I said, it's not only chock full of, of information, details, insights, but it's really beautifully written. Um, and so again, I congratulate you for this and uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Amy.